Welcome to Understanding the Times. My name is Mark Henry, and I want to introduce to you Jan Markell. Welcome, Jan. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, I can't reach all of you tonight, so if you're joining us online, there's a bunch of folks here. So what I want you that are in the room right now, I can't high-five everyone, so I want you to greet someone next to you this way. I want you to look at them. I want you to put your hand up like this and say, welcome in Jesus' name. Go ahead and high-five them for me. Go ahead. Turn and high-five someone. And I want to extend a special welcome to all of you that are joining us online right now. I realize from around the world, I want you to know that Jan and I love you, and uh, we are hear from you every single day, every single week, and our hearts are for you. We, in fact, we met for lunch today. We prayed over you, uh, prayed that God would use tonight to strengthen your hands and your hearts uh, in the days in which we live. And so what I want to do right now is just open us with some prayer, and then I'm going to give some instructions, and then Jan's going to introduce our speaker. Father, we're just thankful for your calling in our life and for the power of the cross that unites us. And Lord, wherever we're at in the world, the thing that we have in common is that there's one Lord God and Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. And God, we just pray that we would remember the great and precious promises that are tied up in Him. Everlasting life, His presence, the fact that He is coming for us. And God, I pray that you would meet each of us in a special way. Strengthen the hearts and hands of my friends. I pray it in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, really quick, tonight there's going to be three movements. The first one is, as Jan's going to introduce our speaker, he's going to be talking to us about the New World Order. It's in the news every single day. Secondly, we're going to have a a panel discussion. And... Uh, thirdly, we're going to have a Q&A. So anytime you see the phone number up here, you can text, whether you're online, another part of the world, you can text us a question, and towards the end, uh, we're going to get those questions, and we're going to try and answer as many of them as possible. So please engage with us. We want to invite you to do that. Jan, why don't you introduce our speaker tonight? Okay, I'd love to. I've known Brandon for probably about five years now or so. Uh, exactly two years ago, I was privileged to speak to his church in Bakersfield, California. I left chilly Minnesota in January of two years ago and ended up in very chilly Bakersfield. It was colder there than here. <laughs> Now, I didn't return the favor. We have a nice day for Pastor Holthouse. We could have brought him in February, and I could have gotten even with him. That's when we had, uh, that's when we had Tom Hughes, who is also from Southern California. So have mercy on these poor guys who have to come to our state and uh, get thoroughly frozen. So, so I've had Brandon on air um, uh, numerous times, and I I just want to say this. There's so much I could say. There are certain watchmen on the wall who are just, they're fantastic. Pastor Billy Crone, another one, and, and Tom Hughes, and, and certainly our guest tonight, Brandon Holthouse, they are watching the times better than anyone I know. And what he's going to present tonight is going to be very cutting edge. It's also going to be very disturbing. But the Bible has predicted all the things that we're seeing today. So as believers... Why would we be, we'd be afraid of what's happening? It's all spelled out in detail in the Bible. And he's given the code to us because it's not that hard to figure out. Jesus is coming again. That's the bottom line. And certain things are going to happen in the season of his return. First he comes in the rapture for the church followed by seven years of hell on earth, followed by his glorious second coming. So uh, the thing that we're going to look at like a laser beam tonight is what's called this coming new world order, this coming one world system. And we are the privileged generation to see it in formation. No other generation has seen this happen, but we are watching it happen. Brandon is going to give you insights tonight, and then we'll talk about it up here a little bit later, and you can submit a few questions. And, and, and again, what a privilege and a challenge to be born for such a time as this. Brandon, come on out, would you please? All right. All right. Well, 
Well, Jen and Mark, I appreciate you guys having me from the land of fruits and nuts. That's where I come from. It is so insane to live in California. You have to believe that everyone there has a Romans 1 mind, and I think they do. But remember this, whatever starts in California ends up going east. So what we're experiencing, you're going to experience as well, as you know. But yeah, we want to talk about this new world order because now everyone's talking about it. I used to be called the conspiracy nut, uh, you know, a tinfoil hat brigade type of guy. But now I'm not because they're saying it now. We tried to point this out all the time, but now... It's front and center, and they're introducing uh, the New World Order. And so we start out with this question. Are we ready for the New World Order? I'm not. I'm ready for the rapture. I'm ready to leave. I've got my bags packed. I'm ready to get on the bus. Um, but for some reason, the Lord has us here not only to view this, but I think as a, a last sounding alarm to this lost world that this is going down. And, and a lot of us, I'm talking to Jan, talking to, to Mark and other prophecy teachers, we didn't think we'd see all of this. Did you? I didn't. Not this much. Now remember, we could be raptured in all of this talk, uh, you know, doesn't make any hill of beans at this point if we get raptured tonight. But what if the Lord keeps us longer? We're only promised to be raptured prior to the tribulation. So if that rapture is closer to the tribulation, then God's allowing us to see more. And there's a reason for that. He wants us to sound the alarm, to be a watchman on the wall. And I think that's what our role is in these last days. So let's talk about it. Let's dig into what their intent is so that we can be this watchman on the wall. So let's, let's use the scriptures to go back where we're at so we can get a, a basis of understanding about this. You go back to Daniel, and of course it starts in Daniel chapter 2, and his metallic man that he saw, or, or that he interpreted from Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but he talked about this fourth kingdom. You know the kingdoms, it was Babylon, Medo-Persia, then the Hellenistic, and then this fourth empire that he could only describe as a beast empire. It had uh, all kinds of uh, conglomerate uh, aspects to it that John in Revelation adds and says it's a piece of Babylon, it's a piece of Medo-Persia, it's a piece of Greek. But it has something that's different. It's very different than previous empires. And the difference is that the beast empire, when Daniel hones in on that, is that when Rome got into place, this fourth empire, it practiced what is called imperialism. And that meant primarily that if, if I'm going to rule that country, the old guard used to send its, uh, uh, or use the natives of that country to run that country. But then when Rome started, they said, no, no, we're not going to use the natives. We're going to put our own people in place and our own armies in place, a la Pontius Pilate and the Roman garrisons all over Israel. But remember this. What was the thing they complained to Jesus about? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? So now you have a foreign entity leveling taxes on people. Look, the Jews were quite fine paying taxes to the temple tax for their own uses, but not to Rome. A sign of imperialism is that one day you and I can see these globalists taxing us on a global tax. And I can tell you where it's going. It's going to carbon emissions. It'll be from a, a globalist system we have to pay taxes to. We could be alive for that. When you see that, that's imperialism. The other form of imperialism is someone else telling us what to do. I cannot believe I am seeing America devolve into allowing these crazy globalists to tell us how we're going to live our lives. We're going to get into that. But the idea that Daniel pointed out is that this fourth kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it. Now, where are we at prophetically? We are in the two legs of the metallic man. There is a division right now. Now, people, people say, well, did Rome really go away? It hasn't. You just haven't seen its imperial form. But when Rome divided, it divided east and west. And let me tell you where it divided, just briefly. The western leg is centered currently right now in western Europe. And the eastern leg is currently centered 
in Russia. Now, why do I say that? Because when Constantinople was taken over by the Muslims, and they saw Islam invading, what they did, their scholars, their, their professors, their politicians, all ran up north to Russia. Why is Russia, in the old days, called its kings czars? Because that's another name for Caesar. And then in the west, they went through Charlemagne, who called it the Holy Roman Empire. And then it landed somewhere in Germany. And what did the Germans call their kings? Kaisers. Or it's a, which is another name for Caesar. We're right now watching the two legs fight. Right? With, with, with what Putin's doing. And this, what's going to happen at, at, prophetically, as you know, Putin, if he, keeps, if he is Gog of Magog, he's going to run into God. God's going to be the one who takes him out. But Here's the thing. Once Putin is taken out, that eastern leg of the metallic man, then the European, the Western Europeans, who are all into globalism, will then take over. And that's what the prophetic sequence is, is playing itself out. So we're at the, the two-legged, but we're going to go to the next form. If you read the text, it says this. The fourth beast, this is in Daniel 7 shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms. That's the difference here, the imperialism. And shall what? Devour the whole earth. That's where we get our understanding of a global government. So it's going to morph from two legs to a beast form, which will be a global government. That's getting ready to happen. That's what we call the new world order. Or, or they've named it all kinds of different things, but this is the current thing they're going with, the new world order. And then ten horns or ten kings will arise from this kingdom. So again, another stage that will happen once the globalism uh, gets set up. Then it will morph into a ten global region area. So imagine one day that America, Canada, and Mexico are is one global region ran by one king. And then you have Europe or Australia or whatnot. But that's, that's where we're at. That's where we're going. And this is what they're introducing to us. So here's the thing. Just recently, they had the Gl World Global Summit. Yes, they're not hiding it. World government. It's right there. They're not hiding it. And they, they, they sit around, and they, they have these discussions of, of reimagining reimagining what the world would be if it was global, and if we could, we could just do what we want to do, and not worry about people voting and politicians. We just want to do our own thing. So these people get together, and they talk about it. Now they've been talking about it for some time, that the World Economic Forum, but here's another group doing this. And so anyway, they, they, they go around, and they have these discussions. So I'm going to show you some clips from it. Um, I'm going to show you right now a commercial that they're, they're, they made for it. Here's what I want you to do. Count how many times it says New World Order in it. Okay? Let's watch this. There's no longer any doubt that humans are heating up the oceans, land, and sea by burning fossil fuels. The world has to overcome not only the damage done to our economies and our societies by COVID-19, it also has to confront the repercussions. التغيير القادمة أكبر بكثير مما نتوقع. I see a future where the internet is available for free for everyone, and that means the location of power is going to shift. Decentralization of power structures everywhere may be the beginning of that shift in finance, in political power. We have to uphold our responsibility, which we have towards the next generation. Okay, how many times did you catch it? Twice. Okay. Again, like I said before, 
This is what they used to say about us. And here's the funny thing. Now that I point it out and you point it out to people, they still think I'm part of the tinfoil hat brigade. They still think I put tinfoil on my cat's head and just like this guy's doing and we're all worried about them reading our minds and the aliens are going to take us away. I mean, seriously, that's, they're even saying that we're conspiracy theorists even though they now say it. It's like, well, I don't know what to do. But here, it is what it is. I'm going to tell the truth and I'm going to tell everyone what they're up to. Notice. All over their website, a new world order. This is taken from their website. Let's just read it together. The World Government Summit Organization is a global, oh, they're neutral, nonprofit organization dedicated to the shaping of future governments. Dedicated to what? The shaping of future governments. Let, let's read between the lines. We're going to get rid of America. We're going to get rid of capitalism. And the free market economy. You notice how they've demonized capitalism, right? Oh, it's greed, it's greed. Well, what are you going to put us on? I can tell you what's coming. Fascism, corporate fascism is coming our way. And these guys have already made deals with the corporations. And what they're going to do is level a new economic system through the corporations with the backing of the government. But it's the corporations that will lead out. And they're going to put everyone else, the small businesses, out of business, as they already did during the shutdown. And it's going to be the, a global corporate fascism. That's what they want to do to reshape these governments of the world. The summit, in its various activities, explores the agenda of the next generation of governments, the next generation of government. Oh, they're talking globalism, focusing on harnessing innovation. Oh, yeah, we're going to use technology to make sure we know where you're at to buy and sell and your GPS location. That's, that's called f harnessing in innovation. And technology. Oh, it sounds so wonderful. It's like peaches and cream. It's like dancing through the tulips. Doesn't it sound so beautiful? It's the beast system. Trying to make itself look appealing to people. To solve universal challenges facing humanity. Do you know what the universal challenges are? Uh, uh, So-called global warming. Or uh, we have a problem with racism systemically in the U.S. Constitution and in the West. We've got to get rid of that. And whatever else crisis they bring up and make. You know how Satan plays the game, right? Satan goes to a house... And he sets the fire in the backyard. And then he comes to the front door with a fire extinguisher and says, Hey, I know that you got this fire. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll be the guy to solve your problem. And then you let Satan in the door and he takes full control. That's what it's going to. This new form of government is about controlling your life. Again, from their own website, since its inception in 2013, the summit has championed the mission of shaping future governments. Oh, sounds so wonderful. Creating a better future for humanity. The past seven editions of the summit have successfully established a new model to collaborate on international playing field to inspire and enable the next generation of governments. Globalism. That's what they're saying. New world order. Just read between the lines. Now, you've got a lot of companies involved in this. And like I said, this is what you have to understand. They've already done the deal with the companies. They've done the deals with Home Depot, Lowe's. They've done the deal with Coca-Cola, Pepsi. They've done the deal with Disney. That's why Disney is doubling down on Ron DeSantis right now. Right? To, to what? Groom kids? Is that what Disney's about now? I'm done. I'm done with Disney. And so was about 68% of the population said, hey, they're going to be grooming kids. I'm done. <laughs> Amen. That's evil, man. But see, they got these corporations. A lot of these corporations that you see here are all globalist organizations. And here are some other partners they have. And they, they, they don't uh, shy away from it. Land Rover is involved in this, obviously. Uh, Zoom. You guys use Zoom meetings? Um, KPMG, you may not know, but uh, I know it because I'm a golfer, and so Phil Mickelson used to be sponsored by these guys, but they're all in cahoots with this. And then you have all the uh, Alphabet Soup, Media, Time, CNBC, and CNN, of course CNN, they would have to be there, Bloomberg, they're all in, uh, in line with them. And, and, and so here's the funny thing is, 
um, they have their talking points. And can I go back there on the screen there? Where's my talking point? There we go. Gotcha. Have you noticed that when you hear a talking head on the alphabet soup media, that they'll all say the same thing? It is weird. It's like somebody gave the talking points out like on Monday and everybody's saying it on Tuesday. It's weird. Now here's the funny thing. They all get the memo apparent because they're all in cahoots. So I want to show you how this lady from CNN is saying the same talking points as Joe Biden. Does that surprise you? <laughs> Joe Biden's being told what to do, right? He, he, he's looking for the next ice cream, man. <laughs> you, ever, hey, you ever notice how much ice cream that guy's consuming? It's a lot. Okay, watch this. Are we ready for a new world order? And now is the time when things are shifting. We're going to have, there's going to be a new world order out there. And we've got to lead it. And we've got to unite the rest of the free world in doing it. Because I believe what is clear is that we have hit an inflection point. I think this presents us with some sig significant opportunities to make some real changes. You know, we are at an inflection point, I believe, in the world economy. Not just the world economy, in the world. And just as the world re-emerges from the pandemic, we are faced with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which certainly feels like a transformative geopolitical moment. Coming as that does against a backdrop of great power struggles, the emergence of middle powers, of climate crisis and cybersecurity challenges, the trend line certainly seem to indicate a world headed in a disorderly direction. Um, we will be looking at what contact tracing looks like in the new world order. We've got to accept that this is the new world order. We've got to accept that this is the new world order. Okay, that's an example of talking points. How is it that you go from Australia, America, or you go wherever, and they're saying the same thing? Because they're involved in the system. That's the problem. They're not making this up. Someone's telling them what to do. Well, who are they? Well, they're the globalists. Primarily, the guy behind a lot of this is Klaus Schwab. Klaus Schwab is an evil dude. And he is somehow got some kind of power over these people. I think it's demonic. Because it's, it's just like they're brainwashed. Well, whatever Klaus Schwab says, we're going to do. It's like, dude, do you even think anymore for yourself? And the, the new thing is this uh, global warming hoax. Let me, uh, let me tell you this. This is part of their system because they have to have a false narrative to get control of everybody. So the crisis is we're burning up the planet and AOC says we're going to die in 12 years. We've got to go uh, no carbon, electric cars, and we're going to regulate what's going on in your home. If you're running your air too hot in the winter, hey, we're going to say throw a sweater on like Jimmy Carter did. Or um, if you're running it too hot or whatever, or too cold, you got to back down. And it then goes to even food. Okay? So this crisis of uh, it's a hoax okay but they're using it to usher in global governance and making that the excuse of why we have to go here why we have to go digital why we need overlords telling us what to do because the planet is on the brink of destruction you know it's funny i did a prophecy update a couple weeks ago about the narrative that's coming from the demonic world about the rapture. Here's the funny thing that people who are channeling demons, and Chuck Missler noted it in his book, Alien Encounters, if you're interested. The demons, or pr pretending to be aliens, are telling the necromancers that Mother Earth has got to cleanse herself. And she's got to cleanse herself from these, these people who have really are on a different vibration. Yeah. 
Okay, so follow me. It's the logic is not making it, but it's demonic, right? So since you and I are the dark ones, that's what they call us, the dark ones. Instead of being the light, we're the dark. We're off on vibration, so Mother Earth is, is going to destroy all humanity. So what the aliens need to do is take the dark ones off the planet. They're going to be beamed up. There's two sets of flying saucers, one in the atmosphere that are invisible currently, and then the other ones on whatever planet Kolob of the Mormon tabernacle or whatever. And we're going to be re-educated. And then they note this. Don't be afraid when all the children disappear of all races all over the planet. They just have met their mission and now they're being taken to a new environment. I wonder why they threw in the kid thing. All right? Because the Lord would take kids that haven't reached the age of accountability in the rapture, wouldn't he? They already have a narrative for it. But look at the narrative from the demonic. The demonic is saying... Mother Earth has got to expunge herself of these bad people. And that's what she's getting ready to do. And so you and I are the cancer. It fits in politically, it fits in spiritually, and it fits in economically. It hits all targets. And now you know it's coming from demons that these people are doing. And this is why they'll say, oops, there's no planet B. That's why they're... they're, they're Getting everybody into a fever pitch. We've got to do something. And by the way, the stats show that if you're a millennial or below, and you've been indoctrinated by the public schools and the universities and colleges, you believe this is the, the tr absolute truth. You absolutely believe that. And think about the millennial generation. Only 4% of them claim to be born again. We've got a giant generation, the biggest U.S. generation ever of 80 million millennials, and only 4% claim to be born again. I think it's probably less than that, but they all believe this because of our public schools. Haven't our public schools done a wonderful job? Haven't you seen how dis the corrupt the school boards are? They're grooming kids, teaching them to be functioning Marxists, teaching them to be one-worlders, not U.S. citizens, but global citizens. And you know this, part of this saving the planet and new world order is to destroy fossil, fossil fuel production. And so they're, they're, that's why your energy prices are going to skyrocket. They're going to ban fossil fuels. Think about this, what California is thinking about doing. They're thinking about making driving on Sundays illegal. Oh, I wonder why you picked Sunday. You know, Pharaoh Newsome, he's always targeting the church. That dude hates the church. But wouldn't it be appropriate? We're going to save the planet. This is part of his thinking. We're going to save the planet. So you guys don't drive on Sunday. And if you do, we're going to fine you. So you'll be at your church and some dude out there is ticketing every car in the parking lot. Let me ask you this. If it goes down in Minnesota, will you still come to church on Sunday morning? Yeah. All right. You, you made that commitment because I don't want anyone saying, well, I don't know, I don't want to get fun with the money. You ought to stand up at some point and say, enough, dude, find me all you want. I'm not, you're not keeping me from church. But they want to prohibit the distance you drive, the amount of fuel you drive, how far you can drive. And if you're on energy, I can tell you what's going on with, energy, uh, with the electric. They want to force us to go electric. Why? They can control the amount of movement we have. Because if you have an electric car, you can't just take off into the sunset. You're going to run out of juice at some point. You've got to find another place to juice up. <laughs> and there's not a place. And so you're stuck, unlike gas, right? Not only that, is when they go to a digital currency, we talked about on Jan show, they will be able to control your gasoline intake if they even allow you to do gasoline. They'll say, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, it appears that according to your digital currency, you've uh, overspent your limit on gas. We are now shutting you down. And it's the middle of the month. You've went two weeks and you've already maxed out your limit. So you must ride a bike. How will riding a bike here in Minnesota work for you guys? <laughs> you know, and then in the wintertime, well, there's something sorry. It might work in California, but it's not working down here. That's for sure. But this is what it's about. Their desire. 
This is another thing they're pushing. Make the internet available for free everywhere and accessible to all. You think, oh, that sounds so great. Why would, why would we not want everybody on the internet? Because they're trying to link and connect everybody so they can control them. So this is what they're saying that, oh, these people in these other countries are internet deprived. We got to make sure they're on the internet. And we got to make sure that they have a digital currency as well. We, we, our digital currency needs to be inclusive. Oh, it sounds nice, but you know what that means? Is that as long as somebody in Africa has a phone, they're linked in. They don't need a computer. Everything will be on the phone. They can have their own digital currency on that phone. And they already have planned this. They know what they're doing. And so a lot of this is, you know, that's why they have to go digital. And we've talked about that before. They say on their own website, the digital economy doubled it by eight times in the previous two years, reaching $4 trillion. And in other words, the global government will have a digital financial structure, which means a digital currency for everybody. Now, let me ask you this. Joe Biden just signed executive order to create a digital currency. How long, let me ask you that, how long do you think it's going to take for that to be implemented in America? I've heard rumors, I can't be dogmatic, but I've heard rumors six months, seven months, by Christmas maybe. It's going to happen faster than you think. Because if I go back to what Messiah said, Messiah told me it would be, when this stuff starts happening, it would be like birth pains. And once you, those birth pains start hitting, they get faster and they get more intense. And that's what we're watching. Think about this. With the last two or three years, did you notice how fast things developed? Okay, that's Messiah talking to us. Watch the rapidity of it. It's happening. It's going down. So look. They, they told their gov the government, Biden says, well, you guys go and research this. Get back to me when you all boys are done. They already have it done. They're not research. They already have it in their pocket. The structure is made. They've been doing this in India forever. Bill Gates wants to take what they did in India and apply it globally, and they will. The structure's already there. So you've got to hear this gal. This gal will blow your mind. Pippa Malgren. Okay, so Pippa goes on this thing, and you got to hear her talk. And she just, she just says it like casual. Yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Like you're going to destroy America. Listen to this woman. It's evil. What underpins a world order is always the financial system. Hmm. I, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71. And so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private, but what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life? Because that's the only measure of whether a world order really serves. Um, who gets to make that determination to have a better life? Who makes the rules? Is it the Christians? Let's go to the Christians and have them make the rules, right? <laughs> no. 
Who's going to make the rules for the ethics of this? Oh, they will. And I wonder what their ethics are. Well, it's already started. ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And then it's DI, diversity, inclusion, and equity. That's their values. It's not Judeo-Christian values, guys. But let's highlight a, thi so a few things that she said. Well, let me get... Did I, am I on the right thing? Here we go. Where, where am I? Where did I go? Okay, it's not on my screen, so sorry. Did I move? I'll have to read it this way, guys. Sorry. We are on the brink of abandoning the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. Right there, we're going New World Order, global, digital. That's what she's talking about, okay? And then the new accounting is blockchain. It means digital. So no more cash anymore. We're done with coins and cash now is what she's saying. It means almost having a perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the world, in the economy. Yes! They will know how much you spent on Snicker bars. I mean, down to that level. They will know, oh yeah, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, we noticed you've bought a lot of ammo lately. Uh, you, when you have um, exceeded your, your maximum capacity and, and bullets, why are you buying so much bullets? Are, are you a terrorist? Uh, they will know everything you spend. And the money's programmable. Well, what do you mean? It means this. We will allot you how much you can spend on beef or meat. I can tell you they're going to eliminate it. They're already thinking that the amount of meat they will allow you to consume is one hamburger a month. That kind of level. Oh. Kiss meat goodbye. You're going vegetarian. Now think about this. I find this interesting. The Apostle Paul warned Timothy about this in the last days, didn't he? I never understood the passage. I just said, okay, maybe it's referring to the Catholic Church because they don't even meet on Fridays in Lent. But it had no, no application for it. I'm like, I don't know how this applies. I think I do now. And you know who will be pumping it? Because Paul's warning how the church goes crazy in that passage. He said, they will forbid you to eat meat. Oh, thank you very much. You know what's going to be the new sacrament for the church? Not eating meat to save the planet. Because they're going to, this is how the, 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 the impastors will frame it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, God made us stewards of this planet. We need to do a creation care. And this planet's reeling with our pollutions and our carbs. Uh, not carbs. <laughs> I'm thinking about food. Um carbon. And so, ladies and gentlemen, to, 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 to obey God, we need to sacrifice our eating habits because, you know, bovine flatulence really causes greenhouse emissions. You think I'm making that up, don't you? You think I just made that up? Nah, nah. Where did I get the concept of bovine flatulence? Because they put bags on the back of cows to prevent the methane from going into the air. That's how crazy they are. They do it in England, they do it here. Bovine flatulence is destroying our planet. I, I, I know, but the, and you know what? You're like, ah, oh, that's crazy. No one believe it. They already do. They already believe it. The world out there is like, yeah, that's right. We're just going to stick to eating spinach like Popeye. It's crazy. Another thing she said. Uh, here we go. Am I back on there? Oop. Okay. I see a future where the internet is available for free. To everyone, that means that the location of power is going to shift. What does she mean by that? Can you tell what she's meaning by that? Decentralizing of power structures everywhere. Oh, so let me ask you this. Where are the power structures now? Well, America is one of them. You realize America is the prize. So the power structure she's saying is going to change location. Yeah, so uh, apparently in order for the global government is you've got to break down the power structures and one of those power structures is the United States. This is what it's all about. We were the last country standing in the way of this. And even when Trump was in office, he said, hey, I'm not going global. You guys are crazy. 
And then he turned on him like a sheep killing dog because he wasn't marching in line. He had spoke there at uh, one of these World Economic Forums and they did not like what he said. And so he became the problem and so the globalists saw it and now, now look, look what you got now. <laughs> right? I don't even have to say anything. I just said, hey, look at that. And what is he doing? Marching in order like a puppet on a marionette string. And who's pulling the strings, man? It's that whole cabinet. It's Kamala. It's all of them. They're all in cahoots being told what to do to allow this to happen. Anyway, another thing uh, she says, it raises a huge danger in terms of balance of power between states and citizens. Yeah, I think so. Because you'll have all the power and we don't. Uh... That's simple to figure out between states and citizens. Yeah, we are going to need a digital constitution of human rights and we're going to have a digital money. Oh, okay, so I really believe Pippa is going to protect me. I really believe uh, Farrell Newsom is going to protect me. Do you really believe Biden's going to protect you? <laughs> or Nancy Pelosi? You think Klaus Schwab? No, no, no. So what is this? We, we grow, we're going to have to have a constitution of human rights. What are the human rights? I told you. ESG, die. That's the human rights. And here's the thing. If you do not go with ESG and die, and you practice your Judeo-Christian ethics in this economy, you will be shut down. They will shut you down. Because, oh, we notice on your social media that you're uh, homophobic, or that you're a xenophobic because you want borders. Oh, we noticed on this post that you are Islamophobic because you got all over Ilhan Omar. You must be Islamophobic or Somaliophobic or whatever the thing they drum up. But here's the deal. Because of that, Mr. Holthouse, we are now going to limit the products that you're able to buy. You're going to be put in a wallless digital jail because they're going to control the buying and spending oh. they won't have to send you and I to jail they're not even worried about sending you to jail they just cut you off monetarily that's your penalty for not complying it's scary stuff no doubt about it 91 countries have already developed a digital currency how Lindsay pointed that out and that's coming from uh, the Atlantic Council so um, look we're, it's happening it's going down all these countries. America obviously is the prize. And Becky Anderson of CNN, you heard her before a little bit, but listen to her and I want you to read between the lines because she is taking full aim at the United States. Listen to this traitor. And just as the world reemerges from the pandemic, we are faced with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which certainly feels like a transformative geopolitical moment. Coming as that does against a backdrop of great power struggles, the emergence of middle powers, of climate crisis and cybersecurity challenges, the trend lines certainly seem to indicate a world headed in a disorderly direction. Is the US-led multilateral system created post-World War II to manage international relations so that the world would never again see and experience the same chaos and disorder of a world war? Is it anything like fit for purpose? And if not, what is the alternative? That is the purpose of this discussion today, so... So, fit for purpose. In essence, what she just told you is the United States is no longer fit for purpose of leading the world as it has been since World War II. We're tired of the United States being the policeman of the world. We now have to allow these middle powers smaller powers to take uh, flight and let them rise while we bring the United States down. See, one of the things they figured out about the United States is they couldn't attack us physically. They couldn't do it. They had to infiltrate from the inside. And what the digital currency will then allow, it, allow 
to happen is we'll allow the United States to be brought down to the level of where everyone's at because they can't bring everyone up. That's the problem. So they got to bring the superpowers down to their level. I find that very fascinating. Because you know what? The book of Revelation tells me where this all ends. This evening out of everybody. And everyone's dirt poor. Now we won't be here for that. But in the, the six seals, what does it say? A quart of wheat for a day's wages. Three quarts barley for a day's wages. And don't harm the oil and the wine. Why does it say that? That's where we're going with a digital currency and a new world system. Everybody gets leveled out and poor. They've already said, look, these niceties that you guys buy, we're, not, we're done with that. You will only be able to buy what you need. I, I just remember you know, reading 1984 and I'm thinking, it was fiction. It's real now. We're living in 1984. And think about this with this new world order, what it means to do to you. They're going to redistribute wealth through the digital currency, through taxation. Because, you know, we live such high on the hog, you know, compared to Honduras or El Salvador. And don't you feel bad for the good things you have? And the rest of the world doesn't have it. It's not fair that they don't have education, access to the internet, yada, yada, yada. Free how They want to make everyone on the world have housing. Can you imagine that? Everyone have education. Who's going to pay for it? You and I. Because they're going to take that digital currency and then redistribute it to where they want to put it. And that makes you and I poor. Now, I don't know how much we're going to see of this. I don't. But I need to prepare. And so I'm going to conclude on this. I'm not here to scare you. Prophecy is meant to prepare you. But here's what I want you to think about. Not only do we need to be watchers on the wall and telling everybody about this and warning them, hey, you need to get on the rescue ship right now uh, of Jesus or you're going to be left behind. That's number one. Number two, if we're still around to see a lot of this, then we need to prepare mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically for this. Because I watched what happened in the last two years in the shutdown and Christians were not prepared. They it got hit out of left field. They couldn't believe what was happening. They thought that they, they believed the narrative that two weeks and we're going to have a shutdown and then everyone's going to get back. And what happened? It didn't. So here's what I saw as a pastor. Depression, anxiety, people walking away from the faith, disillusioned. And what was the, delusion, the disillusion about? Well, I think it was this. People unfortunately misunderstood prophecy. Now, what do you mean? We believe the rapture is imminent, don't we? It can happen at any moment, right? There's nothing that stands in the way of it. It can happen right now. But unfortunately, too many times uh, in prophecy circles, they taught the rapture as first event. Now, what do I mean by that? That's not imminency. First event means we're not going to see any setup. We're not going to see all any of this. We have it in theory, but we'll never be around to see it because the rapture will happen and then the setup will happen. Guess what? That's not the way it's rolling out. You still maintain a pre-tribulational rapture. But guys, we're right in the middle of watching the setup. And we need to prepare for more. We've got to have like two narratives going on in our head. One, we could be raptured at any point in time. But man, if, if the Lord tarries, I'm going to see more. And so I need to wrap my mind around what our world is going to look like, how my ministry is going to look like, how I'm going to function. Look, God is not going to leave you out hanging in the wind. He promises that the righteous will not beg for bread. You might have your economics reduced, but he's not going to abandon you. He will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ. He will do that. You have to believe that. But this is where he's asking all of us, you've got to step up your faith. Because all the world around you will look like chaos, and you could crumble and shrink back. And he's saying, no, 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 that's not the time to do it. You need to trust me even more and be bold about what you're doing. Because we could see some bad stuff. Are you okay with that? Are you okay if God lets us seize that? Why do you think he's doing that? One thing, I'll, I'll leave it with this. 
he said in one of the parables that he gave in the, the, the this was the Matthew 13 parables. These are the uh, kingdom, mystery kingdom parables. These were introduced because of Israel's rejection of uh, the kingdom at that point in time. And he says this, he, in one of the parables, he says, look, man, there was a field, and, the, and the, the guy went out and sowed the field, but then an enemy came while people slept. And that enemy put in his own seeds, the tares, right? And, and so it's funny, as, as the, the, the farmer slept, the enemy did this. As the church was sleeping, the enemy, Satan, infiltrated our church. Why we were sleeping. Why we were worried about numbers, nickels, and noses. Thank you very much, Rick Warren. Thank you very much for the seeker-friendly movement that put everybody to sleep. Thank you very much. But now God's saying, I'm going to sift the wheat now. I'm going to separate the wheat and the tares. I'm separating the Philadelphia element of the church from the, the Laodicean church. I'm separating all those people out right now. And... It doesn't look that he's done yet. I'm not putting a time frame on it, but I can tell you if more is coming our way and we go to a digital currency, it's going to separate more people out because they won't be able to handle it, especially those who don't know prophecy. So I'll leave you with this. With this kind of knowledge comes responsibility. A big responsibility. As Jan said, we're privileged. There's no doubt about that, man, to see this. The prophets long to see this day. Okay? But man, I'm telling you what, to whom much is given, much will be required. If you know this, if you understand it, if you can connect dots, uh, you have a greater responsibility. So whatever God has you to do, you stay at your mission. You don't ever give in to these people. You fight all the way to the end until the Lord's ready to call you home, right? Amen? Because the Lord, you're going to be in front of the Lord at the Bema seat when we're all raptured in there. And he's going to ask each one of us, where were you when the battle was raging? Where were you when the apostasy of the church was happening, where were you? And I want you to be able to say, Lord, I was witnessing. I was handing out tracts. Lord, I was teaching a third grade Sunday school. Lord, I was doing, uh, uh, going to prophecy events and spreading the word out. You want to be able to say what you were doing in the battle. If you're already in the battle, great. But if you're not, you need to get in right away. So ye, you can hear the words, well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come share your master's happiness. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for what we can learn about this crazy world and what you're allowing them to implement. We see your hand in this. We see your sovereignty, your control of all of this. And you were guiding this for a reason. To put Jesus back on the, on the throne of David to rule and reign for a thousand years. We look forward to that, Father, that time. But here we are, Father. We need strength. We need encouragement. We need help. Be with us and help us to carry out our mission. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Hey, let's give Pastor Brandon a hand right now. Brother, thank you for sharing with us uh, tonight. We so appreciate it. Well, you know Jan and I are committed to bringing you events like this, especially as we live in the last days, trying to strengthen your hand to encourage your soul uh, because we know we live in evil days. But I'm going to ask you to help us tonight to defer some of those costs, and so we are going to have an offering. I'm going to go ahead and ask the ushers to come in the room and to come forward and help us with that. Uh, if you're writing a check, would you please make that out to Mark Henry Ministries? If you're online, you can donate at our webpage or on our app. Uh, we would greatly appreciate your help in that. But let's go ahead and pray right now. Father, we're thankful for tonight and the things we've already heard and the things we're going to hear yet. And Lord, we just pray that you would allow us to continue to have events like this until Jesus comes, until he delivers us safely to his heavenly kingdom. Father, we are looking forward to the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May it be soon. We pray it in his name. Amen.
Well, hey, get it in your calendar right now, June 9th. Mark Hitchcock and Jeff Kinley are going to be with us. Uh, both of these men are great servants of God. If you haven't read their books, I want to encourage you to go online, find their books, read them. Your heart will be greatly blessed. They're men of God. They're great scholars. And they're going to be sharing with us. Now, sometimes when I say scholars, people are like, oh, they're not going to be great communicators. They're going to be sleeping through it all. Trust me, these men will communicate the Word of God to you in a powerful way. In fact, let's watch this. Well, I'm very excited to talk to you about the Antichrist today. That's probably the only time you're ever going to hear anybody ever say something like that. You know, Jeff mentioned that uh, my wife and I have been married for 39 years. We were married when we were five years old. So you can do the math on that if you, you math people out there can uh, you know, sort of figure that out. Uh, I grew up, as he said, over in South Carolina, not far from here, in fact, and uh, most of my family is still there. Uh, my, uh, my family, he mentioned three boys, you know, I, I had to have three boys, and the reason why was because my dad came from a family of nine boys and one girl. Believe that? Bless her heart. <laughs> Which, of course, as you know, is Southern for glad I'm not you. That's what that means, right? And then my oldest, and then my dad had three boys, my oldest brother had three boys, and then I had three boys. So we think the Kinley name's going to be around for quite some time, unless something tragic happens to us, right? But uh, excited to be here with you this morning. I want to go ahead and just uh, talk about the elephant in the room, because we have all been through a lot in this past year, in the past year and a half, really, and uh, it's taken its toll on us. I can see some weary faces out there, and I know if you're anything like me, you're just like, you just want this thing to end, but uh, we're still in it, aren't we? But uh, it hadn't just affected you and me, it's affected other people too, it's affected celebrities out there. In fact, uh, take a look at Taylor Swift, what it's done to her. <laughs> Tell you what. I'm going to be honest with you, I used to get a little jealous because she's kind of rich, you know, and famous and all that, but now I go, bless her heart. So, anyway. There you go. Get into your calendar, June 9th. These men are going to be with us sharing right here in Brooklyn Park on June 9th, 7 p.m. Central Time, or you can watch us online. Uh, join us. Your hearts are going to be blessed. Well, at this time, let's welcome our panel. Okay. Say just a few comments about some things in back, but before I do that, I want to build just for a moment on what you just saw, because Jeff Kinley and Mark Hitchcock, let me clarify, this book is not out yet, uh, it'll be out in about sometime in June, but they're going to be talking, the two of them, about the substance of this book, which is titled, The Global Reset, Do Current Events Point to the Antichrist and His Worldwide Empire? As they've co-authored this book, again, it's not out, it'll be out in June. Uh, this is an advanced copy uh, for, because I'm going to have them on radio and all. So, but that's going to be part of the discussion on June 9th, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, we do have some items on the back table, and some of you, I hope, were given sort of a program for tonight, and it talks about some of the items that are available on the table. And, I, and I, I'm just going to highlight a few of them, including, I wouldn't normally do this, but we've got a magazine back there, and the only reason I'm highlighting, and you can take it, we can take several copies if you'd like, <clears throat> there's an article in this magazine, it's titled, <clears throat> Is Digital Tyranny Coming? It's by John Whitehead of the Rutherford Institute. And it's what we've been talking about and we're going to discuss a little bit more tonight. And if you're trying to understand this, and sometimes it uh, gets to financial issues and we haven't all studied financial issues. And I'm saying, uh, I'm citing in this article, uh, Ruther the Rutherford Institute, Mr. Um, Mr. Whitehead, he says, he's, get used to the term Central Bank Digital Currency, CBDC. So get used to this term, CBDC. We might talk about it, but we've already talked about it in the presentation. That all it means is everything's going digital. We don't know when. We don't know how much the Lord is going to let the church see. So take one or more back there of the, the magazine, and then just some things I'll highlight that there's a lot of products. Uh, Pastor Billy Crone, who was here in October, Are You Ready for the Rapture? Nine DVD set is back there. 
the fastest selling product we've had, I think, almost ever, a DVD, Enemies Within the Church. Um, what can you say other than a lot of things have infiltrated the church that have harmed it seriously? Talks about that. And the presentation that we had here in February, Pastor Mark had his friend and mine, Tom Hughes, we do have that on DVD, the hour and a half to two hour presentation, and that reminds me, this presentation will be on DVD, hopefully within three, four days, um, it, certainly within a week, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org, and go to our store or call us, and the presentation tonight will be available. A tremendous new book by Terry James and Pete Garcia, The Disappearing Future Events That Will Rock the World, is back there. It's a book. And then another wonderful book, oh, so uplifting. Don't we need it? The Triumph of the Redeemed, An Eternal Perspective That Calms Our Fears in Perilous Times. Thanks to you, we really need this tonight. Yeah, okay? no kidding. I scared everybody. <laughs> yeah. So a tremendous new book that we're carrying. All of those and much more on the table. I'll try to be back there. Brandon will try to be back there and greet you when, when we're finished tonight. Go ahead, Mark. Well, tonight we've got a, a number of uh, video clips, and some of them we've already seen uh, tonight. Uh, in fact, I want to go ahead and show the first one. I want you two to respond because this is, again, President Biden speaking. And, Jan, you've used it multiple times. Yeah. I used it in our church multiple times. Yeah. You've used it. Why is this such a significant statement? Let's just watch this again. We are at an inflection point, I believe, in the world economy. Not just the world economy, in the world. It occurs every three or four generations. As one of, as the, uh, one of the top military people said to me in a secure meeting the other day, 60, 60 million people died between 1900 and 1946. And uh, since then, we established a liberal world order, and that hadn't happened in a long while. A lot of people died, but nowhere near the chaos. And now is a time when things are shifting. We're going to there's going to be a new world order out there, and we've got to lead it. And we've got to unite the rest of the free world in doing it. So anyway, how did you guys feel? Now, there, there's there's elements there. I mean, he talked about the economy just before that the section that we saw. Then he describes America and uh, Pax Americana that we 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 brought a level of peace. Uh, to the world, but now there's a new world order coming, and this happens every three or four generations. Uh, if you know something about history, this is this is massive. How did you feel when you saw that and processed that? I felt like Daniel 10. I <laughs> literally collapsed. Yeah, this is the leader of the free world capitulating to the globalists. It's as simple as that, and it had to happen. This is the, the last frontier, America, the last frontier, and it's been conquered by the globalists. There's nothing left for them to conquer. They're going to march in. Will the church be here? Frankly, I don't know why we're here now, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> yeah. Amen. I mean, that's, we're, we're leaving very, very soon. Revelation 4 is at the doorstep, okay? But that, I think, Mark, that told me more than anything. The leader of the free world, calmly, just matter of fact, uh, we're part of this globalist network. Simple as that. Go ahead. I, I think I was a little stunned because um, I thought America would hold out for a long time. And I'm watching the collapse of America. And that's, that's what it's signaling to me that, look, man, if, if, if they go digital and they do this and they implement, and there are, they are, there's no coming back. That, that's the thing I realize is like, okay. You know, and there's been a lot of people, and, uh, and I get it, the sentiment, well, I, we want to get our country back and all that. And I get that. I would love to see our country back. But if they do this, you're not seeing it come back. And now I, th I think prophetically what needed to happen, because everybody would always say, what's going to happen to America? Why are they not in prophecy? I now know why we're not in prophecy. It's not like we don't exist. Yeah. It's that we're at like a, a second-rate country at that point, you know. So anyway, um, very difficult to watch, I would say. Yeah. Very difficult. And it's not just President Biden who's saying this. It's yeah. our legislators that are saying it. And the judicial department uh, of, our, of our governance as well is bought into this. It's, it's, just, it's just amazing. It's stunning. Yeah. Mm. Stunning. Yeah. Again, it happened suddenly. 
yeah. and the election had to go as it did. But look at that, that's only like, what is this, 18 months ago? It's a year yeah. and a half ago, roughly. Look how fast. Lightning speed. Yeah. Lightning speed. Uh, again, this is one of the clips that you showed, but I want it's 19 seconds long. I want us to catch the first sentence of Pippa as she describes the importance of finance and how it, how it moves forward in the future. So let's go ahead and watch this clip. Brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting. And okay, the first sentence was, how very important the financial structure is to everything else. Yeah. Elaborate. Why, why is that fundamental to everything else? Well, I think we were talking, you know, off, off the stage. Um, in order to have a system like this, a new world order, you have to have the economics in place. And that's what they've been working on. And so once you, you have your economic foundation and the structures in place, then you can implement you know, what you're going to do in the government as far as controlling. Here's an interesting thing that what Scripture says. If you look at the Babylon system that's going to come, and the Antichrist will eventually rule through that, the, anti, the, the Babylon system has three elements. If you notice it, if you read 17 and 18 of Revelation, it has a political aspect that's referring to the kings, and then it refers to the economic aspect, the merchants of of the world. They're involved. And then you have the whore, which is the religious aspect. So you have a three-legged stool. So even in the Bible, the Bible is saying you're going to have to have all three elements in order to have a, a global government. And, and so, the, so the economics has got to be there, but the religious aspect has to be there as well as the glue that puts these people together. Yeah. You know, as I think, as I look back in history, one of the key elements to be having a, a, a superpower. So think about a bell curve for just a moment. If you're going to have a superpower that's going to lead the world, this has been true all through history, it starts with an economic system hmm. that's prosperous, that allows for the creation of a strong army, that allows for them to control the trade of the world. That brings a stabilization and peace, a superpower. That's what President Biden was referring to just a second ago. And then the, the downhill side starts with the economics. You have to destroy the finances to weaken the army, to make them a, a middle power, and then another power arises. So this, this is a, that, sentence, that sentence is absolutely right. Um, there has, if we're going to have a new world order, there has to be a new financial system created, and here it comes. Now, this next, uh, this next clip is her going a little bit farther, and she's going to focus on a couple of things. I want to ask you a couple of questions about it. Let's watch this next clip. We are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private, but what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. A new accounting system, so think about it, a new application of math. It's kind of like my grandsons were at a wedding the other day. The younger brother looked at his older brother and says, how many wives can a man have? The older brother said, well, 16. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. <laughs> so a new math. So, so just, just quickly, talk to us about blockchain just really quick because that is a completely new system 
of accounting and why is that significant? That's the well, first question. Well, again, it's digital. I mean, it's all digital, all digital money, no cash, no Bitcoin, none of it matters. It's just the digital, that's what blockchain means. But here's what I found interesting. She's talking about we need, we need a new digital constitution of human rights. This woman is a globalist. She's from the London School of Economics. She's a one-worlder. She cares less about a constitution. They right. care less about any kind of Bill of Rights or human rights. They could, they could walk all over these constitution and Bill of Rights, but she's talking about, well, we might need a new Bill of Rights for this new kind of money. In Intriguing that she would say this in that these folks care less about our constitution or human rights. I think when you look at blockchain, you know, people have the idea of like Bitcoin or something like that where it's a cryptocurrency. This ain't crypto because they'll know everything about you. So it's nothing that you can hide. It exposes everything about you, and then it's programmable. It's That's programmable. the problem. That's right. It, they can program this stuff, and like, they can limit on what you buy, or they can say, look, here's another way. They can force you to buy what they want you That's to right. buy. This month, we have programmed the digital currency that goes to you that you need to buy more eggs. You haven't been buying enough eggs, so you will buy these eggs this month because at the end of the month the digital currency you have for eggs will vanish and this is how they're going to force and control the law of supply and demand this is how they're going to try to control inflation is they're just going to force you to buy something when you don't want to or limit what you can buy that's the level it goes with this whole blockchain thing and if you read the president's executive order uh, back on March 8th, and it's 35 pages, it's rather boring if you're having a problem sleeping. Great document to read. Uh, I, I've read through it, and it was one of the things it says, we're going to create a new currency, a digital currency, and we'll be able to control inflation because we'll be able to add immediately money or take money out immediately, and we'll be able to control supply and demand. So that means we control everything. Oh, we're shutting down this, we're shutting down that, we're adding this to the economy. It's yeah. fascinating. Um, yeah. Let me, let me uh, kind of shift gears just a bit. And uh, Klaus's, uh, Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum, he's got a right-hand man yeah. who has worked uh, hand in hand with him through these recent years. Uh, He's talked about not only the global, you know, world economy, but obviously digital, all these things we're talking about. But what I want you to catch in this next video clip, and I want you two to comment, is, is how invasive it is. I mean, think about, we're going to have this digital bill of rights. By whatever happened to for the people, by the people, of the people, I mean, that's totally out. But, but listen to this carefully and, and kind of catch what the intent is and how intrusive it is. Let's listen to this. And COVID is critical because this is what convinces people to accept, to legitimize total biometric surveillance. If we want to stop this epidemic, we need not just to monitor people, we need to monitor what's happening under their skin. What we have seen so far, it's corporations and governments collecting data about where we go, who we meet, what movies we watch. The next phase is the surveillance going under our skin. We now see mass surveillance systems established even in democratic countries, which previously rejected them. And we also see a change in the nature of surveillance. Previously, surveillance was mainly above the skin. Now it's going under the skin. Governments want to know not just where we go or who we meet. Above all, they want to know what is happening under our skin. What's our body temperature? What's our blood pressure? What, what is our medical condition? Now humans are developing even bigger powers than ever before. We are really acquiring divine powers of creation and destruction. We are really upgrading humans into gods. We are acquiring, for instance, the, the power to re-engineer life. Humans are now hackable animals. 
you know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. I mean, all this story about Jesus rising from the dead and being the son of God, this is fake news. So hackable, <laughs> people are hackable now. Tell us what that means. Tell us well, what the implications are. I, I think we need to explain who this Mr. Yuval Harari is. He's an Israeli. He's a homosexual. Um, I think, and he, he's the person that Klaus Schwab listens to more than anybody. He may be the most dangerous man on the planet. You've just heard him for a couple of minutes here. When he speaks, world leaders listen, including to the nonsense he just spoke there. You think uh, if you if you ever want to see what evil looks like, it's that dude. Okay, I mean, if you listen to this guy speak, man, this guy is full out evil. The things he's thinking about. But what he's really trying to do? They want to hack your brain so that they can tell you what to think and how to think. And when he that last little clip that said that Jesus rose from the dead was fake news. He has, he is a, such a God-hater. Yes, he is. believes that any faith in God, the God above the clouds, he calls him, that any faith is just fictitious and fake news. So he wants to be able to hack the brain to eliminate people believing like that. He believes that's a false narrative. And so they have their narrative. And so with this digital currency, with this ability to hack people and put things under your skin and perhaps in your brain, um, they want to be able to control the thoughts of people. This is why it's so dangerous. And Elon Musk has talked about it and a few other people about putting chips in your brain and things like that. That's where they're going, guys. Now, I hope, I hope we're raptured before that. Um, but for goodness sakes, that's pretty evil. Is basically they want to destroy belief. That's right. Belief in the one true God. Now that's when you know. I, I would say that guy's probably satanically, Absolutely. demonically possessed, man. To say things like that, that is antichrist language. We blaspheme the God of heaven. Keep your eye on this man wherever you can hear him. Listen to him. Yeah. And, and, and Bad dude. Ponder what he's saying. It's, it's very dark. It's very dark. Recently in an interview he was talking. He was talking about hacking us. And he said, you know, we're going to have these implants so that you don't believe fake news. And, because all, and he went on. He says, all of us have this propensity, you know, to different things, to think about politics this way or ethics this way. But we're... We're going to make sure that when we, when we do this, we'll, we'll be able to keep people from these things, anything that's fake news. So that resurrection statement, that's why we included that in the video tip, clip, because he specifically says the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to keep people from believing the resurrection or anything about biblical morality. So huge. Huge. Well, let's, let's pivot just again, just really quick. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, anything about Watch the Water. Uh, it's an hour-long video that, that came out just recently. How, how many have seen it? How, how many have, have seen, seen it? it? How many have seen it? Okay. Okay. Uh, um, and and it, in the first five days, 5.4 million people saw this. Jan and I were bombarded. I'm sure Brandon was as well. People are saying like, Mark, is this true? What are the, what's going on here? And, and uh, Rather than uh, kind of tell, I just want to show you the first video clip, and basically it's going to show you what the premise of the movie is, what the point is, what they're driving at, and so let's, let's just see this first clip. COVID-19 is not a respiratory virus of any kind. It is actually venom poisoning, and they're using, I believe, synthesized peptides and proteins from venoms of snakes, and they're administering them and targeting them to certain people. So Dr. Artis here is presenting information to say that COVID-19 isn't a respiratory virus as you know, we've all been thinking. It's really this, uh, this uh, secret ambition of different groups to take cobra venom and ultimately put it in the water system. And many, many people have responded and asked about that. 
And so there's different elements to it. And uh, there's, there's obviously, you know, are the, these facts true about the venom and then how it's spread. We'll kind of talk about some of those. But Jan, you recently sent me a, a, an article just a couple of days ago on that. And give, just give us your thoughts just kind of from, from what you've seen and experienced. You've been interviewing people throughout COVID uh, this whole time. Oh, you know, where, do you, where, where to begin? I mean, this was... I think launched on uh, Stu Peters' internet program. Stu is a, a believer. He's from the Twin Cities. Obviously, this went around the world, as Mark said. Five million watched it almost instantly, which is, I mean, this is beyond, uh, beyond internet taking, taking the internet by storm. Um, a lot of us were left wondering, well, what are, what are, what are, do we even believe this? And then I started reading, um, it's Mr. Artis here, I believe he's a chiropractor, and I, I've been reading some reviews by some doctors, uh, MDs, and, and they're, well, they're putting, they're trying to graciously say this is really silliness and nonsense. And uh, don't be afraid to brush your teeth and take showers because the water is not going to hurt you. But that's, that's the kind of fear that's being instilled in a lot of people. Yeah, and over the next com coming weeks, Jan and I will be talking more about it, I'm sure, as, uh, as more people look into it, specifically around the science involved with it. But you know, you and I have to use wisdom when people say something, right? And so there's certain presuppositions, and he gives the presuppositions, then he presents his evidence. And then he specifically goes on and, and, and gives a bunch of details, like how the venom is spread to all of us and, and uh, the testing. And, and then he talks about his theology. So what you and I have to do is apply wisdom when we hear different things. I may not know everything about the science that he talked about at the first part, but when the rest of it is yeah. way off base, you should take notice. So what I want to do is just kind of quickly jump to this next video clip, and it describes how he believes it's being spread to all of us. Let's watch this. Now, the thing about the water is this. They are using the water systems because they can target specific demographics. They are absolutely confident that the peptides they have chosen for COVID circulated throughout the earth and throughout the populace specifically targets and the mRNA specifically target organs like your spleen, your pancreas for diabetics, that's a concern, brain tissue, liver tissue, lung tissue, and heart tissue. So if you already have a disease process of inflammation of any of those organs, you are the ones they're targeting. So the people that work at my water treatment facility are aware of this? They're in on it? No. Okay. No. The CDC's in on it. And the CDC is working with contracting companies to make sure they do it. Okay, so he's saying, you know, COVID is not respiratory, it's snake venom, and it's in the water. Brandon, just how, how do you respond to that initially? <laughs> well, first of all, I go back to biblical wisdom like you pointed out. you got to have two or three witnesses when you establish a, a fact or a truth. And the problem is there's no one along with him witnessing to the same thing. So that's the first thing. As When I watch the video, I'm like... I don't know where you're coming from. I want to hear from other doctors like P uh, McCullough, and I want to hear from the uh, the inventor of the RM and uh, sorry mRNA, um, and I want to hear from those guys that we we've, we've listened to all through the the shutdown and all that, but none of them are saying anything. Robert Malone is not saying anything. And so that starts raising some red flags. And then when you go into this guy's theology about, oh my goodness, we're, gonna, we're taking in DNA from a snake and it's going to create a, what, a Nephilim hybrid out of that? I mean, what, I don't understand theologically how that happens. I mean, I understand the Nephilim in Genesis 6, but the guy's way off theologically. And I'm not trying to be mean to him, but my goodness, man, um, where are you coming off of? And so when you don't have your facts together and there's a lot of things medically that there's gaps and he's just stating things and not providing evidence. And then when he jumps over into theology and brings in the, the Pope and the Catholic Church and I'm like, okay, this is the same as QAnon, guys. Yeah. 
And you have to be careful because you know what happens when you follow people like QAnon or other people that are giving tall tales? We lose credibility in the prophetic world. Uh, 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 not only with other believers, but with the outside world because, oh, you're part of the tinfoil hat brigade that, bring, that thinks that snake uh, venom is being put in your water. Um, and that gives us all a black eye. So I, I wish people well, so. wouldn't do it, but you can't stop them. YouTube is full of these types of people. And uh, until I see more witnesses and more evidence, mm -mm. it's a stretch. It's a problem. And I, I, I need more facts and evidence. So I wouldn't spread it if I were you. I would not spread it. It's not verifiable. So that's my take on it. Well, the theology, Mark. You yeah, we'll, we'll you, touch on theology you in the next one. got to look at the theology. Yeah, we'll touch on theology in the next one. But just think about water for just a second. When I watched that, I, I used to do underground utilities. We used to put in wells, do all sorts of things. And I'm sitting there. This guy is from the city, obviously, because he has, does not understand where the water comes from or how you get it across the world. He talks about how it's in the water system around the world. And so if you've got COVID, it's, in the, it's because it's in the water around the world. Do you realize that most people in the world still get their water out of wells? My friends had COVID throughout East Africa, West Africa. Uh, it, there's not someone running around dumping, CDC's not over there dumping this, this venom in there. I mean, seriously, right? Yeah. Uh, we've got folks right here in Colorado, in fact, in this room, that live on farms right around here, and they've, they've had COVID, and you say, well, they, they got it from the water, and the CDC's dumping the water, you know, to put it in the water here in, in, in the metropolitan area. Well, I'm just telling you, they bathe in, in well water, they drink well water, they wash their clothes in well water. And if, just so you know, if you actually believe this, you, you better not brush your teeth, do not take a shower. Uh, yep. you, you know, actually, when I saw it, I looked at my wife and said, great, now I get to live on Mountain Dew. She goes, I don't think so. Drink your water. So that's my point, though. When somebody makes such a, such a statement that is completely impossible, you just might want to consider that. So let's talk about his theology for just a second because um, he ties this in and makes a theological statement. I want you two to weigh in on this before we get to our Q&A. So let's, let's see this last clip. And you are made up of a DNA strand of genetics that are unique to you. If I was gonna do something incredibly evil, how ironic would it be that the Catholic Church or whoever would use the one symbol of an animal that represents evil in all religion, which is either the snake or the dragon, which is actually just a snake with legs, you take that snake or that serpent and you figure out how to isolate genes from that serpent and get those genes of that serpent to insert itself into your God-given created DNA. I think this is the plan all along, was to get the serpents, the evil ones DNA into your God-created DNA. And they figured out how to do it with this mRNA technology. They're using mRNA, which is mRNA extracted from, I believe, the king cobra venom. The king cobra venom. And I think they want to get that venom inside of you and make you a hybrid of Satan, no longer just belonging to God or a creation of God's. So if you believe what he said, and it's in the water, how many of you have had any water over the last year and a half? You are a hybrid of Satan. That's the implication. Yep. Is this good theology, guys? Oh, man, that's the worst. Oh, man. I, I was sent this at least 100 times by people who said, Jan, you got to see this. I think they're on to something. Okay? People fell for this by the millions. We're just trying to explain that uh, maybe that wasn't the best idea. So I, I, I'm trying to figure out the guy. How does that work? So if I, I drink the water and I get snake DNA, which is from Satan, not a snake. 
just Satan. So I become non-savable at that point. I, I, I'm not a made in God's image. All of a sudden, I cre- I'm a, what, a hybrid? So is there, we know there's no salvation for hybrids. So what do I lose my salvation? You see the implications theologically where it goes. It challenges eternal security. That's why I know it's demonic. Because if it starts challenging theology and things that we hold, then I know where it's coming from. It's challenging our salvation. Oh, we can drink the water and become a hybrid and lose salvation. That's the implications of what he's trying to say. That's serious, man. That's someone that's bordering on, hey, that's a little heretical right there at some point. And, and so I think we have to be very cautious about following this. And I was talking to, to Jan and Mark about this. There's a thing that happens with human beings called confirmation bias. And we, 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 we know that all of this stuff was evil. We know the, the mRNA, all that other stuff is, is bad stuff. We got that. But then when someone comes along and says, and it's worse than that, well then what can happen is you start having confirmation bias. And you're like, yeah, it's evil. And yeah, you're right. That's, that's happening too. That's how QAnon functioned during the Trump administration and the election is they, had, they, they capitalized on, on this uh, bias that people have. We know it's evil. I don't need to have an untruth to know that it's evil. And neither do we, uh, neither do you. And so at that point, you got to be real careful about confirmation bias because that is Satan pulling you in so you can lose credibility. And so be careful about this stuff because here, that's not the last one that's going to happen. There's going to be more of this stuff and they're, 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 they're taking people away from the truth. So anyway. You know, when I, when I saw that and he specifically talked about becoming a hybrid of Satan, my mind, I don't know what your mind went to when you saw that. I went to Acts chapter uh, uh, 28 verse 3. The Apostle Paul's been out preaching. He's, he's shipwrecked in a, in a place called Miletus. And he's pulling sticks together. And he's setting them on the fire. And a viper comes out and latches onto his hand. Do you remember that? And everyone's going, oh! God's judging him. He's going to die any second. He's got poison in him. And then he doesn't die. Remember that? And then they're thinking, oh, he must be a God because he didn't die. And, and then he preaches the gospel and many, many people in, in Miletus end up getting saved. Can I just tell you that he didn't become a hybrid of Satan at that moment? <laughs> when he says, seriously, I mean, you got to think through the Bible, friends. Think through the Bible. God's given us this book. And then when he talks about this hybrid of Satan, he talks about... Uh, you're going to be a hybrid of Satan. You're no longer going to be God's. Can I, uh, God's children, just think about the implications of that. Romans chapter 8. Who will separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day. Christians have suffered for the last 2,000 years for Jesus' name. We are being considered as sheep to the slaughter, but in all things we are overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, life, angels, principalities, things to come, things present, nor powers, heights, depths, nor any other created thing, king, cobra, venom, in water, (laughs) shall be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. My mind went to John 10. Listen to these words. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give eternal life to them. And they shall never perish. And no one, no one, Satan or any government authorities, CDC, shall be able to separate them from me. Let me give you another one. Jude 24. Listen to these words. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in his presence of his glory with uh, blameless with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all time now and forever. Amen. Amen. To him who is able to make us stand. And then 1 Peter comes into mind. 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on and describes there how God has caused us to be born again. And then listen to verse 5. It says, 
that you are protected by the power of God for a salvation ready to be revealed when? In the last days. Friends, you're protected by the power of God. Turn to someone and say, you're protected by the power of God. You online, you're protected by the power of God. I don't care what anybody else does. When you know Jesus, you're protected. By whom? The power of God. So hold on to that, whatever else you hear. Well, having said that, let's, uh, let's pivot again and let's, let's move to our Q&A. Jan, you've got a number of questions yeah. there. Why don't uh, you start us off? I, I would like to do that if I could give a commercial first. I'd love to. And that is starting tomorrow, my, this weekend's radio features Michelle Bachman. Again, talking about the digital, the same things we were talking about earlier. Uh, we'll talk for about an hour on air this weekend. If you don't know how to listen, just go to my website, olivetreeviews.org, and it's a continuation. Uh, by the way, Mike, this last weekend, these two gentlemen were my guests, and uh, my goodness, the stats went crazy. There's an interest in what we're talking about, and, and a concern. How do we cope with this transition to a new way of, of life? If, if we're going to be around here for a little bit longer, who knows, how do we cope with this new way of doing money. Uh, so Michelle and I continue that discussion this weekend on radio. I would like to go to quickly, uh, Mark, and, and talk about uh, number six here and just make a comment. And the question is, and it's, and forgive us for not even having brought it up, thank you whoever submitted this, is the Great Reset the Tribulation? We don't know, but my personal opinion is the reset is the tribulation. In other words, um, it, it's Daniel's 70th week, um, otherwise known as, as the tribulation in, in Revelation. But if we're that close to the tribulation, and the church never experiences the tribulation, we're out of here maybe tonight. Yeah. yeah. So that's my opinion. You gentlemen, please weigh in, but I believe the reset is the tribulation. I would love your opinion. Yeah, because they're setting it up. And so obviously we're now seeing the setup. And, and what they're setting up is the beast empire. Yeah. So their name for it is the great reset or new world order. Our name for it is the beast empire, the fourth, uh, the fourth kingdom that Daniel predicted. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it will be set up and it goes into the tribulation and then eventually Antichrist gets control of this thing. Um, and and every, this is funny, everything they're doing would allow one individual to control the entire system. I don't know if they know that or not, but everything I watch is, is setting up for one individual. And I thought, wow, wow. So anyway, yes, I agree with Jan on that one. Yeah, and as I, as I see it, again, the, tri the tribulation has a lot of components to it. And what we're seeing now are just the things that have to be in place for the Antichrist to control the world, control all the people, control the economy, control the worship, making sure people don't end up worshiping Jesus because the resurrected Christ is obviously false news. Um, and so, you know, it, this is, again, just the setup for that. Yeah. So. Uh, Mark, this is a, a, a good question here. With the rising New World Order, how should we as Christians respond? Should we reject this? Should we repent? Should we rejoice? Those are three options. And uh, obviously, if you don't know the Lord, repenting is first and foremost. But uh, should we be rejoicing over what we're seeing? You know, I think there's, I think it depends on where you're at in life, yeah. right? If I don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. If you've trusted in Christ, I just want you to know, Satan is using all these things to unsettle your soul. Yeah. And Jesus has made a promise to us that he's coming. He's prepared a place for us in heaven. That we're citizens of heaven. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. And that's the reason Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So Satan, we know, is going to work to use this to unsettle us. What you and I need to do is to lean into God, enlarge our faith, insult Satan, 
by not being troubled. Amen. Do you understand that, my friends? He, he just rejoiced. When you are un, coming undone, oh, woe is me. I'm just telling you, it's the wrong response. Our response is to be courageous, to be obedient, to be zealous for every good work. Don't grow weary of well-doing, Galatians chapter 6. And first and foremost, have the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Listen, this is so important. We can trust God as we walk through this. Prophecy tells us one thing, that God knows what's coming and he's got a solution, so don't fret over it. Amen. Amen. Here's a question for you, Brandon. Um, how do we regard pastors who are unwittingly, unknowingly embracing the world's thinking of globalism, CRT, etc.? Oh, man. <laughs> That's what I have to deal with all the time. Um, well, first of all, you have to go in. If the guy is just ignorant, okay, then there's two types of fools in the Bible. There's one who's a, called a fool who just needs information. Okay? So if you're dealing with that pastor and it, all it needs is you to give him the information, whether these books or not or whatever, or just telling him, great. That fool will actually gain knowledge and then become wise because they receive the knowledge. If you're dealing with a guy who is a different type of fool and this fool rejects knowledge, that can tell you do, what to do with that guy. You need to leave. Amen. You need to get out of that church. And that's the, 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 that's the thing. I, I, I see a handful of people, pastors, that are waking up, but the majority of them, as stubborn as, as you can come, they don't want to. And I can tell you this, when you go into their, their, their uh, room there, their office, and you're trying to tell them out with it, you're better off understanding that a wink is as good as a nod to a blind mule. Did you catch me on that one? It doesn't matter what you do. A wink is as good as a nod to a blind mule. Because when they're that kind of fool, they're not receiving information at that point. So shake the dust off your feet and move on and find a good church like, like uh, Pastor here. But, um, but you first have to give them a chance. See if they'll receive the information. If they don't, then it's, that's, that's your sign. And what Paul would say is, well, if you can't change leadership, then you're unequally yoked. And we use that, type, that passage a lot of times for, for marriage. But really, he's not talking about marriage in that context. He's talking about doing spiritual enterprises together with people. Yep. Well, then, if that church isn't that way, you're unequally yoked at that point in time. Try to find a good one. So that's what I would say. But it's a problem. It's a problem. Just keep... Oh, go ahead, Jim. Well, I just want to say that we have a new world order coming. You know that. It's called the millennium. I mean, that's the new world order that's for true. the Christian. Yeah. And that is what is upsetting the devil and the pagan world so tremendously is... Perfect government is coming. King Jesus on the throne in Jerusalem. That is the true new world order in the most positive sense you can possibly imagine. Praise the Lord. We're going to be there. And the government shall rest upon his shoulders. That's what we're looking forward to. Great. If you go to uh, MarkHenryMinistries.com, uh, there's, there's seven tests that are given about false teachers and false prophets there um, that may be helpful kind of going as you're, as you're talking with pastors. There's a gospel test. There's a fruit test. There's a theological test. They're all found in the Bible. There's just seven different verses that God has given to us as we sort through that. Now, just keep in mind one thing, that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He hates the church. Know this, Jesus loves the church. And you and I need to be the ones who are building the church, gathering Jesus' name. Do it, even if you have to open your house. Uh, Pastor Brand, just really quick, tell us, you're, you're creating an app to help people yeah. find church. Tell us about that really quick. So we saw the need out there with yes. all these remnant believers out there. And we get flooded and inundated by people. The number one question is, I can't find a church in my area. So what we decided to do is we're creating a new website, and then on that new website we're going to have an, um, uh, a church tracker on there. 
And what people will be able to do, not only in the United States, but around the world, as we talk to remnant believers everywhere, you'll be able to go on this app that we have and, and try to find good churches in the area. And, and we thought that would help people. And I will say this, we're also taking people who are part of good churches and they locate them for us and say, hey, I go to a good church. And then if that all checks out, we'll put it on that, that church tracker because there's nothing out there right now that people can figure out things. So um, we said, well, let's try, to, let's try to do this. So it's embryonic, but hopefully we'll have more churches on there. And, and if you're part of the church somewhere and say, hey, Brandon, I got a good church, contact us. We'll look at the doctrine, we'll, we'll talk to you more about it, and we can put it on that church tracker and help other people find churches. So that's what we're trying to do. And that is the most frequent email that this my ministry gets. And, yeah. and, and folks, I wish we could help more. Um, and that, would, that is, where can I find a solid church? And you fill in the blank. Parts of Australia, parts of Europe, parts of Canada, all of America, they're all asking that question, where can I find a good church? Well, there must be a root problem. Uh, there aren't very many good churches. And we're not trying to beat up on the church. Pastors have the toughest role on the planet, I guarantee you. I've worked with them for years, and they can't please everybody. Um, but finding that solid church that number one we'll talk about the full counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation yeah. is one of the most difficult things you can find yeah well Brandon thanks for bringing that and, and, and working so hard on that we're taking a little different tact here with Mark Henry Ministries and even uh, Revive Church here and we're we're, we're wanting to help. As we've traveled around the world doing missions, we recognize that the free world is the one that's struggling the yeah. most with this right now. Because we're used to buildings and seminaries and all of this. But I can tell you, traveling around the world, the underground church is thriving yeah. in other parts of the world. And yeah. so one of the things we've done, we just brought on a new staff person that's going to be helping us um, train people and I just, want, I just want you to know, we are probably going to do like 50 to 100, so you can reach out to us. But this year, we'd like to see 50 to 100 home churches started throughout the world. we got a system for that. We'll be starting that. And maybe if Jesus tarries, it'll turn into much more than that. But this first year, we're just trying to do 50 to 100 or so. But listen, you got to open your homes, and you got to say, if Jesus isn't preaching in this city... Uh, the first church Jerry and I started in the Rocky Mountains. There were seven churches in that area. There was two churches that shared the gospel, but that was it. The rest of them were completely uh, gospel void, uh, like Galatians chapter 1 verse, verse 8 tells us. And, and so, um, but they weren't, they weren't teaching the whole counsel of God. So there was this one couple, and I talk about them in my book. They just started praying. For seven years they prayed, God, would you give us a great church? In this, in this community. And God did an amazing work, answered their prayer. They opened their home, had Bible studies. And that's a thriving, thriving church in Western Colorado today. So we just want to encourage you to check that out. Great. Let me ask a question of the two of you, and maybe we can kind of wind things down with this. And that is, I think a lot of people are asking it, is how can we prepare as individuals or families if the Lord is going to tarry and we're going to see more and more of this coming cashless society, a new way of doing money, how can individuals and families prepare today, tomorrow, next week? We start with you, Mark, and then let's move to Brandon, and then I think our time is up. Yeah, the, the first thing I would encourage you to do is you and I need to be saturated with Scripture. Um, and uh, if again, if you go to MarkHenryMinistries.com this week on Monday or Tuesday, We'll be, we'll be having a new uh, link right at the top of the page with 20 key verses that are both commands and principles that you're going to really need to own in this new economy that's being created, okay? So that would be number one. Let me just give you four quick thoughts. Num as I kind of thought through this and helped folks and, and been meeting with folks, number one, you and I need to trust God, not our resources. One of the great blessings that you and I have had is we've had lots of resources, you know, like if I, uh, I mean, I'm coming to work and I'm hungry, I just go ahead and pull over and buy something. Well, we're going to live much more like our brothers and sisters around the world where that's going to be, a, a, that may be a luxury. Um, so you're, this, this concept of 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says, trust in the Lord, not your riches. And then it talks about sharing and doing good in spite of that. Another verse is Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, when Jesus says, 
do not be anxious, do not be anxious, do not be anxious. And he talks about how God provides for the birds. And then he says, you focus on this. He says, um, seek the Lord, seek his righteousness and his kingdom. And then what? All these things shall what? be added unto you. So there's a priority of thought. There's a, there's a devotion to the Lord. I, I think there's another key element in Philippians chapter 4 where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many, you've seen that on coffee cups. You've seen it on shirts. The context is I've learned to be content with much and I've learned to be content with little. I can do all things through Christ. Read, the, read chapter 4. It's right there. That's the emphasis. In Christ, I can be content with whatever happens. And friends, we're going to have to learn that. So here's, here's just a couple of real practical things. Proverbs 21 verse 5 says, The plans of the diligent lead to an advantage. You say, well, Mark, what do, what do I do? Give me like three steps. Okay, when we ask for wisdom, we have a plan. Here's, here's just three things that I think you can do that I think it's wise. Uh, number one, set aside some extra food. There's, there's some watching right now that I've talked to. They're, they're, they're setting aside some extra food, and not only for themselves, but for others in their church family that they know can't financially afford to do that. I think that sounds biblical, and when you read the book of Proverbs, you're going to see that as a biblical concept. Do you realize our forefathers and everyone throughout all of history prepared in the summer for a thing called winter? Hmm. And so they canned, they, uh, they, they, they dried meat, and, and they prepared you know, coming out west, the Oregon Trail. I think we need to think more like our pioneers, more like people have in the past. Number, number two, reduce your debt. I'm just telling you, pastors always tell people, you know, be content. Don't be a slave to the lender. Proverbs tells us that it's going to become really painful in the very near future. Number three, hold on to assets, not liabilities. As Americans, we're used to every time we get an extra dollar, we get another liability. We go buy something, we put something down, we get more credit. Um, I'm, I'm just, I just want to encourage you, buy assets. Because assets are going to help you in the days ahead. And that's exactly what Joseph did. You remember Joseph in the Bible? There was a famine coming. You remember uh, Pharaoh has the dream and he's got the, the fat cows and the lean cows and the lean cows eat the fat cows. And like, what in the world's going on? And then he comes along and says, there's going to be seven years of plenty. Friends, you and I have enjoyed the plenty. Yes. Praise God. There's lean years coming. Okay? And so what did Joseph do when he was put in charge? Because he was the only one that had the wisdom of God. He stored up a commodity. In that particular case, it was wheat. So I think that's just prudent. I would agree with that. That's excellent, man. Let me, let me, let me tell you what I'm seeing a little bit. The Lord's asking you to step up. And he's asking you to step up in your faith to a level you've never been before. And this is what he's laid on my heart. The requirement that you're going to be required to have a certain amount of faith that you have now is not ready for that, that what's coming. As it goes for me too. I've got to step up my game to a whole different level of trust. And Mark's right about the trust. But let me, let me explain something real quick. You have to dive deep into your soul. And make sure, number one, I don't have places in my life that I haven't worked on. If you have issues and you've buried them, I can tell you what's going to happen to those issues. They will be exploited by the demonic. They will be footholds in your soul that they will work from to make you afraid, to intimidate you, to scare you, to demonize you. Because I'm dealing with this all the time. Your, what, what is going to be required is something you've never experienced in your life. It is a, you're entering a time period that we have been too comfortable with uh, right now. And what the demand is will freak you out. Because the demonic is coming after you. Like you've never seen it before. And I'm telling you this because this is what I'm seeing on the ground. We have constant people being attacked by demons. Yeah. Constant. People just trying to serve the Lord. They're pinned to the ground. They've got things cussing at them in the closet. They've got things rattling. They're having full manifestations appear in front of them. And these are people not in the occult. These are Christians trying to serve the Lord. I have never seen that before. 
I've seen people who are involved in the cult have these activities, but I'm seeing a whole new level. And what I'm telling you is they're trying to shut us up, trying to prevent you from serving, trying to prevent you from backing off. All of this is intimidation tactics, and the demonic realm has ramped everything up. So what I'm saying is, with where you're at spiritually, it's not enough. You have to get your game ready. You have to grow in areas that you've never grown, and you better be willing to forsake those weights that hold you down spiritually. Things that you already know the Lord's been telling you, I need that out of your life. Because that is what they're going to go after. Hmm. So please understand the game has changed. I can't overemphasize that more. I see more paranormal stuff happening to people yeah. than I ever have seen in my entire ministry. And it's coming your way. I don't mean to scare you, but you need to prepare. <clears throat> you brought this up on our radio program this yeah. last week. And um, the comments that came, we talked about this for six, seven, eight, nine minutes only. And the com I was deluged with comments about what you're, not so much the, the money angle, the comments, but heavily what you just said. People identified with what, with what you said. Can I make one announcement, please? And that is, if, if, if tonight has been helpful, it, this will all be posted once edited. It's got to be edited. MarkHenryMinistries.com, OliveTreeViews.org. The entire two hours will be available. Give it maybe three or four days for editing. Tell your friends, please, to tune in. Again, MarkHenryMinistries.com, OliveTreeViews.org. Pastor, gentlemen, I, I personally want to thank you for being Christian leaders in a day of despair. And thank you, Mark. Thank and you. thank you to this church back there. God bless you. If you'd give me one second, I want to end with Psalm 37. Just be seated for just a second. And I want to leave you with this verse. Jan and I were talking this week, and it's like, you know, you could leave here depressed. You could leave here discouraged. And so Psalm 37 gives us a, uh, an exhortation. In fact, it gives us a prohibition, something that we're not supposed to do. And that's stop fretting. Stop fretting. The Hebrew word is to stop being angry. I mean, when you see those things up there, I mean, some of the videos we saw, I don't know about you, it's easy to become angry. And, and actually, listen to these words. Uh, 37.1, it says this. It says, do not fret because of evildoers. How many of you know that there's some evildoers? <laughs> so don't be angry. Don't be angry. Um, do not be envious of the wrongdoers. Then verse 8, it says again, do not fret. It only leads to evil doing. You see, if you and I become unhinged and angry, it's only going to lead to us doing evil. We got to walk in the spirit, be controlled by the spirit, see evil men doing evil things, not fret. And then it gives a list of things that we are supposed to do. The first one is we're supposed to trust in the Lord and do good. Now, do you remember in Hebrews chapter 11 in the hall of fame? By faith, Noah builds the ark. How many of you know it was bad days in Noah's day? How many of you know it was really bad during Enoch's day and says the Lord took him? By faith, the Lord took him. Cain and Abel. Abel. It says, by faith, he became the first of the martyrs. The ground cries with his blood. I mean, I could go down through that. We have to exercise a faith. Stop fretting. Stop, stop being angry. More faith. More faith. And then it gets, let me just read the list to you. It says, do good. More faith. Do good. Delight yourself in the Lord. Where are you going to find some joy today? Not in the news. But you'll find it in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be named to all men. The Lord is what? Near. 
So find your joy there. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do with my finances. I don't know what I'm going to do with my family. I don't know what I'm going to do with my job. I don't know what I'm going to do with my business. But Lord, I'm going to honor you. I'm just going to commit my way to you. I'm going to follow you with whatever happens. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did when they said you got to worship the idol. No, we're just going to follow God through that. And you're going to see the glory of God show up in a big way. So trust God. Do good. Delight yourself in Him. Commit your way to Him. Listen to this next one. Rest in the Lord. Go home tonight and go to sleep. You rest in the Lord. Lord, you've got this whole thing figured out. I'm just resting in you tonight. Right? I'm telling you, that's what God wants. Mark, I got it under control. I know how this all turns out. You only know about it because I told you. It's okay. I got it covered. I've got a place for you in heaven. And then the last one is wait patiently for him. Patience, my friends. Jesus is coming. Every time Jan and I are together, it's like, I can't believe we're having lunch again. Yeah. I thought we were going to be having it in heaven today. And, and then it's like, well, we're waiting patiently. Why? Because the Lord is patient, not willing that any should perish. Yeah. Think about it. Just this last week, we've had several people trust Christ. They're not going through the tribulation. They're going in the rapture. Why? Because God was patient. You be patient. Keep sharing the gospel. So stop fretting. Trust in the Lord. Wait patiently for Him. You act and do good between now and then. You honor the Lord. And then listen to verse 9. It says this. For evil doers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. The blessing is ahead, my friends. The blessing is ahead. Now, this last week, a week ago today, a lady reached out to us. Her name is Donna, and she said, I'm afraid she's, she's, she's got a terminal disease. So one of our pastors, went, and she said, I'm afraid to sleep at night because I'm afraid that I won't wake up in heaven. And, I, and that might be you tonight. It might be you watching right now. If you're afraid that you're not going to wake up in heaven, that when the rapture comes, you're not, I just want you to know, she said that to our pastor Jeff. And Jeff told her the good news of the Bible. The good news is this, that God has kept his promise. He's provided a savior. His name is Jesus. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. And when he's dying on the cross, our sins, the sins of his people were placed on him so that those who would believe in him would have everlasting life. That's what Jesus promises. And you say, well, why is he different than anyone else? Because he rose again the third day. Dead people don't come back on the third day, but Jesus did. It was... Amen. You can clap on that one. It was prophesied a thousand years before. Jesus said it over and over and over in his ministry. Even his enemies said, he said he's coming back. Let's seal up the tomb. Listen, friends, Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible says he is declared the Son of God by resurrection. You know, she heard, Donna heard that message, and she says, I want to believe in Jesus. And Jeff said, do you know that you're a sinner? And she said, yes. Do you know that Jesus died on the cross to pay for sins? Do you know that? Yes. Do you right now choose to trust in Jesus alone to save you? She said, yes. And then she said, then Jeff said to her, well, let's pray and thank God. And so he prays and Lord, thank you for sending Jesus. And she says, Lord, thank you for sending Jesus. Lord, thank you for sending Jesus to save me from my sins. Lord, thank you for dying. I'm trusting you the best I know. She got all done. She opens her eyes and she says, Pastor Jeff, this feels so good. Could we do this every day until I die? <laughs> Seriously, friends. And Jeff says, you know, once you got Jesus, you don't have to do this every day. And then, then the next day, he took her a Bible. It's the first time she's had a Bible. She said, he said she just cradled it like this. Why? Because the words of God are precious to the people of God. So I want to invite you, if you've never trusted Christ, to, to, like Donna, do you know that you're sinful? Do you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for sins? That God raised him triumphantly the third day? Do you right now choose to trust him? Jesus, I trust you. Why don't you pray with me right now? Lord, we confess that our sins have separated us from you. And Lord, we're thankful that you sent Jesus. That he died on the cross for sinners. A sinner like me. And the best I know how, I trust in him.